Okay, CC students, the next topic we're going to talk about is direct examination. Now, you have to bear with me tonight because I've been fighting a cold, but we're going to get through this together. So there are um, two videos that we're going to do about direct examination. The first is an overview of direct examination and what it is. The second video is going to be how to conduct direct examination. So let's get on that overview and let's talk about that. So direct examination is the calling of witnesses by either the prosecution or the defense. So there are certain witnesses that they want to call to help advance their case. Those witnesses, when they are called by, the, by that side of the case, either the prosecution or the defense, they're witnesses. They are examined under direct examine uh, conditions, and we'll get into that in part two. But why do we do that? Why do we call witnesses and um, have them testify? Well, there are three general purposes, and the three general purposes of direct examination is to present your story of the facts. So you have a story that you want to move forward that you believe occurred in this case. These witnesses are going to help tell your story. Without the witnesses, you can't tell your story, so you're going to present your story of the, uh, of the facts. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to build your major ideas as outlined in your opening statement. And if you watch my opening statement video, we talked about this where uh, you get up and you talk about what happened that night. You, everything that you've said is, is accurate or would be accurate, but it doesn't prove your case. So everything that you've said in opening statement is just an overview. It doesn't prove anything. So if I tell the jury that this is what occurred on this night, and how do I know it? Because these are the witnesses and you're going to hear and this is what they're going to say. If I sit down and I don't present anything, I haven't met my burden of proof. I have to bring witnesses forward now to help support um, my, uh, my major ideas as I outlined in my opening statement. And just because I bring forward witnesses that help me move forward my case is not enough. They have to be credible witnesses. They have to be somebody that the jury is going to believe. And we're going to work on that in part two on how to build witness credibility. Uh, a, a good direct examination is like a talk show, um, like the Ellen DeGeneres show, where uh, she brings these uh, five-year-olds on that talk about um, the presidents or geography, and they're great, and she has a conversation with them. You don't f <clears throat> The attention is never on Ellen. Um, the attention is on the guest. So Ellen is basically the attorney conducting direct examination, and the guest is a witness who's there to tell us something, tell us a story, you know, talk about a book or talk about the presidents or whatever it may be. And the reason people watch this is they feel like they're part of the discussion. And a good direct examination makes people feel like they are taking part in this discussion. You know, and, and trying jury trials, the hardest thing is to try and uh, determine whether or not the jury is is grasping these concepts could but you need to ask the questions for them because the jurors can't raise their hand and say excuse me what color was the car you need to answer that for them and people in the courtroom want to know things they want to know what happened in this case they're watching this case so you need to tell the story for them you need to ask the questions for them you're the only one you're the attorney up there you're the only one that can get this information out of the witness and you do that in the form of direct examination and it's more than just asking people what they know. It is controlling the flow of information. You know, I can ask officer, were you working that night and tell us everything that happened? Um, that's not going to be an effective direct examination because in about three minutes, uh, the jury is going to be falling asleep. The witness is just going to be rambling on and you're not controlling the flow. So you need to be prepared to... Um, take a, a large chunk of information and that's why we're working on the witness statements and putting them on an ante chart and begin to break that down into question 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 to move along to control the flow to go from one point to the next and that's what effective direct examination does it controls the flow and we uh we how do we prepare for direct examination well you're already doing it um what you the first thing is you examine is what facts do i need this witness to prove what do I need them to prove? And they may need to prove, help me prove the legal elements of the crime if I'm the prosecution. So I might need to pull the, the, the facts that support the legal elements of the crime. There also might be um, my factual theory of my case. And I need this witness to help me um, establish my theory of what occurred. 
And the reason that this is going to happen is this witness is going to come in and testify in support of my theory of my case. So we also examine the witness's statements, and you should be doing this, and you take an anti-chart, and remember we put on the one side the prosec things that are helpful for the prosecution, things that are helpful for the defense, and things that are interesting. Well, the next step now is going to be we pull that information off of each chart, and if it were the prosecution, and this is our witness, we want to move through those things, those points that are helpful for the prosecution, and we begin to organize them into some uh, organized idea that makes sense and it is logical, believable, and understandable. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, we also want to use the uh, anti charts to organize what the witness will testify to and what exhibits they're going to testify to. On my uh, before I would try a case, I would always put in the column when I got to the question about an exhibit, I would have a, a box there or something and I would say, I've handed you what's been marked as this exhibit and we'll go over on how to do exhibits. But I would have an outline of my questions and I would know when I was going to get to an exhibit and what exhibit this witness was going to testify to. I had this all planned out in advance and we'll go over on how to do that. There are certain things that these witnesses are going to testify to in direct examination and it, it's broken down into five parts. And the easiest way to talk about that is to look at it is talk about it like this. So your witness, you want to look at, does your witness have facts that they know that can establish your legal elements? That's one part of their testimony. So facts that can establish the legal elements of the things that you have to prove. The other thing that you would look at is facts that your witness knows that supports your story, your factual story. So it's two parts there. Facts through their testimony that support your legal elements that you have to prove, and then facts that support your factual story or, or your factual theory of the case. That's another way to state that. There's other things that your witnesses will, may testify to. And there, are, there may be facts that your witness knows that can be used to rebut your opponent's burden of proof. And there are also facts that your witness knows that can be uh, used to rebut your opponent's factual story. And while you were working through your Annie charts, I'm sure that there were certain facts that you struggled with where to put them. And you didn't know whether you should put them for the prosecution or the defense. Okay, well here's how this works now. You can take those same facts and you can use them to support your factual story of your case. And maybe, they, maybe on your anti chart you have them on both sides. You can use them to support your factual story of the case. And they can be used um, by the other side to support their factual story of the case. That's one way. The other way that these facts can be used is there are clearly facts built into your mock trial that are only for one side. Those facts can be used to rebut your opponent's factual theory. Okay, so these are the basically the overview of the categories of where we put things. Facts that support your legal, the elements that you have to prove, facts that support your factual story, facts that your opponent can use to rebut the uh, uh, elements, or facts your witness can use to rebut your elements of your opponent's case, and facts that your witness knows to rebut your opponent's factual story. So either way, these are the facts. And there's one last category, and we'll get into that. These are facts that harm your case. And you're probably wondering, why am I talking that on direct examination? Because we were talking about building credibility. We were talking about um, things that uh, would be used to prove our case, right? Well, sometimes you're, you're given facts and a case and a trial that harm your case. And we're going to talk about how to deal with those in the second video. So, as part of your preparation, you're going to work, the attorney and the witnesses are going to work together to develop the questions. And one tip is that you always finish strong, so you finish on a high note through your direct examination. You should not end with a negative question or a negative uh, area of the testimony. We'll get into that in video two. The other thing is, I can't stress this enough, is to practice. 
and you're allowed to do this. So the witness and the attorney should spend time practicing. So this is not the first time this witness has heard this, these questions. So you're going to work together and practice. Uh, practice the questioning and practice the response to the questions. The other thing, <coughs> we did talk a little bit about this, is you're going to examine what physical evidence your witness is going to, to uh, testify to. Um, and we said the testimony must be logical, believable, and understandable. Most important fact, if you've done a good job, if you've been effective in direct examination, the focus of the testimony, the focus of this thing will be on the witness, not on the attorney. That's the key here. We're taking our attention off of the attorney and we're putting it on the witness, just like a talk show host does for a, uh, um, with a guest on a talk show. It's not about the host, it's about the guest. And it's not about the, wit and not about the attorney, it's about the witness. I hope this helps and we're going to get on uh, part two on how to conduct direct examination.